thankful to be here all the time. I wouldn't miss an opportunity to be here. But we have some serious things to talk about. Um, I normally don't like to really use notes, but sometimes I get carried away, and I do mean carried away. <laughs> Tell the church in Youngstown sometimes, here's my point in case I never make it back. Uh, and that's because I get excited by the word. It's the one thing in my life that I'm always excited by. So um, I'm here to talk about confronting your generational, personal, and private uh, Struggles or brokenness is the word we're going to be using. Brokenness in your devotion to God. That is a problem on three distinct levels that the church needs to pay close, close attention to. Because we can find ourselves in the church on cruise control. You all know what cruise control is? <laughs> We come to church and we don't come to worship. Well, this is the church in the pews. This is the church building. And we come, the church people, to the church building to worship Almighty God. If that is not articulated enough, we will begin to be on cruise control. We will come to the building and we will become socialites. Hmm. We'll be overtaken by communicating with one another and going through the routine of the five articles of worship. I'm just going to say it like that. And that distinction is biblical, but it is not spiritual if you are not in the faith of God. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm hoping to prove this morning, because this was the problem with this young man. Let's look in uh, the book of Matthew, and you can find this story in other areas of your Bible. I think it's in, it's in the synoptics, and it, uh, it speaks in different manners. One says he came running down. Up in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 19. Let's look at it this way. Let me know when you're there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, he said, uh, which commandments? And Jesus said, you shall do no murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal uh, or bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well. The young man said unto him, Well, all these things I've kept from my youth up. Uh, what's missing? What do I lack? And Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect, go and sell what you have, and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Well, then, uh, uh, the Bible says that, uh, he, he didn't want to do that, did he? Uh, it says, when, he, when the young man heard that saying, he did what? He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. I want to cut our lesson down now. And uh, so if you take taking notes, that you can, uh, we can break it down because definitely a college subject matter the way it was given to me. But I write it this way. Brokenness, confronting brokenness in your 
devotional life to God. Because talking about this young man doesn't really help us unless we can see ourselves in his life situation. That's the purpose of it. We have to be able to see ourselves in his life situation. Now the question is, we need to define brokenness. Because brokenness is a vast subject, but in the case of what we're talking about, brokenness is something that simply doesn't function properly. Brokenness is something that you can say is a malfunction. It, uh, it's, like the, it's like the garage doors uh, that sometimes uh, you hit the button and it goes up halfway. And somebody has to get out and hit it or shake it or something, and then it creeps its way on up. The brokenness is not something that is broke. Brokenness is something that doesn't function properly because of some interference or some obstacle, something in the way stopping it from being what it's supposed to be. Now the question comes, how can we worship God if we are in the state of brokenness? The Bible says God is what? Spirit. And they that worship him must worship him out. Spirit and spirit and truth. Well, if something is broken in brokenness, it's not true. It is not true. It cannot be true. It cannot, in other words, it cannot be trusted. It cannot be confided in. Well, preacher, uh, all of us have some type of problem like that. Yes, but what is it that sustains us during this time? It is the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ is what sustains us. Mm -hmm. But it don't just sustain us once saved, always saved, that type of thing. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that is giving us the time for the Spirit of God to educate us on how to become more intimate with God. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't want to get fancy at that. <laughs> it's important not just to be a Christian, but to continue on a daily basis to look forward to developing a relationship with Almighty God. Here comes a fellow. Uh, I like the version that says he comes running down. Uh, and, you know, he, maybe he wants to be seen, but in his mind, he pretty much thinks that he has all the bases covered. You see, and I've talked with a lot of men, especially men in the church, who would say, man, well, you know, similar to this. I figured after I had eliminated smoking and, and drinking, and, you know, I figured that I was doing pretty good. Well, the external things, oh yeah, it's, it's proper to exclude the external things, but where the real problem is with, with us in the church is in the heart. Mm -hmm. You see, if your heart isn't right, you are not going to function right for God. And Lord knows I've been in the church. How long have we been in the church? Ricky, you've been in the church longer than me, so I guess you can gauge me somewhere around 35 years somewhere. But I was, I was really young mm -hmm. <laughs> when I came into the church. I was like nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see, you got to be true. But anyway. <laughs> Your heart has to be right. So let's look at this, because on a generational level, we see the problem starting with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were the first parents that we had who set our generations and our relationship with God in a broken state. Amen, gospel fans. It put us in a state of brokenness. And then the, the devil wreaked havoc with our brokenness because he found out that we could be persuaded to do something against God's will. 
And so Adam said, uh, 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 well, God said to Adam in, in uh, verse 9 of Genesis 3, he said, Adam, where are you? Listen to this closely. Where are you? What state are you in? Adam was now in a state of brokenness. Adam had broken uh, his word to God. You can eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree that sits in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You can have everything else, but don't break and do this. And what did they do? So then when the Lord comes back, we identify his brokenness through what he said. He said, where are you? He said, I heard your voice walking in the garden and I hid myself. <laughs> I hid myself because I was naked. I was in a state of brokenness. Y'all got it? Mm -hmm. Now, today if somebody says, uh, God told me this, you know, on the inside track, we know that we read it in the Word or something, but sometimes people think you're saying that God just spoke, you know, by divine revelation. No. So let's understand it this way through Adam. God said, who told you you were naked? But a better way to understand it was, who made you know? Who made you know that you were naked? You see? And that's what we're after. Satan wants us to stay naked, but he does not want us to know. He wants us to think we are all right when we might be going wrong. There's all kinds of brokenness. Write them down. Let me give you some of these. Brokenness is sometimes in your dreams. If you plan to be an astronaut and uh, things change, your dreams were broken. But what do you do with something like that? Brokenness sometimes, and I tell parents this all the time, you can discipline your child, but do not break that child's spirit. You don't have to, I'm not gonna get into that, that was Lee's message, but sometimes we attempt to discipline and we break the spirit, that is wrong. Brokenness deals with Love sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah. She broke my heart. And I was so much in love with her. Well, you know, it's brokenness. You know, and, and, and with each one of these uh, relationships and, and uh, self-esteem is another problem. With each one of these, listen, for every action, there is a reaction. And we react to something happening and it sends us spinning. Well, this is what the enemy wants. And so the rich man comes and he doesn't understand generationally, he's already been set up. He's, he's set up thinking that he is fine. But the system that he was going by was a system that God put in place as a teacher, not the final product. He was going by the law. But, watch what happens. He said, all of these things, right, I have kept from my youth. Now, when he says that, as a 50 cent word in the Greek called toretto, and it simply means to be on guard or to watch or to be like a century. In other words, watch this. I, all my life, I've had my eye on what we believe in. Write it this way. He was religious without a relationship. Well. See, he had his eye on it. 
I've been told, if I've been told once, I've been told a hundred times. I don't think you remember Rick, but I remember one time we baptized a lady by the name of Lizzie Blackshaw. She was a double amputee, and I was preaching in the nursing homes. And uh, I had been talking to Miss, well, Sister Blackshaw, and uh, she lived across the street. And uh, when I talked about baptizing her, they didn't care until I started talking about baptizing her. And then they started shouting, we are of this religion. So I had to come back and say, Miss Blackshaw, your family says that they will not agree to you being baptized because you are of this kind of religion. And she said, young man, you go back over there to that phone and call them and tell them I know that they're using my house for an after hour joint over there. And if they don't let me be baptized, I'm going to call the police and have them all thrown out. <laughs> well, I called back. I said, Sister Blackshaw has indicted you all. And some things that she said, I'm not going to repeat them. I said, but I think you know what she's talking about. And you know what the fella said? Well, we have to respect your wishes. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ricky and somebody else, they carried her into the water and baptized her. And she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. You know what she was trying to do? She was trying to cure. She realized the brokenness in her life. She realized that there was something missing. Now the young ruler or the young man or the rich young man, the Bible calls them all those, he realized also that there was something missing. But he came as if he had it all together. That is a problem. We come to worship every week as if we got it all together, but we know that the reason that we're here is because something is missing. Well, and to sit here and not to grasp it when the preacher is preaching, man, I tell you, I tell folks, do not walk the other way when the invitation is being extended. You see, they don't know they're being used by a force that they haven't paid attention to, but we are trying to create the same momentum, trying to get the church to go in the same direction, that's its members, it's like trying to get a flock of birds to all fly in the same direction. It is so important. If you look at birds, you will see when they flock, you don't see one backstroke in the other way. They all fly in the same direction. When you see fish in a school, they all swim in the same direction. If you look at horses in a herd, they all run in the same direction. But the smartest people on the planet are going all kinds of ways. And that is because they have been given a free will to do what they will. And so the choice has to come, not in having your eye on your faith, your eye on this little mama believes, because that's something dangerous. I have been doing some statistics. I'm not going to give those to you, but I've noticed this. When mama or daddy dies, if they were at the pinnacle of the family, a lot of the kids leave the church. And we have to confront that. Generationally, I've been in the church. My grandfather was in the church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Generationally, the same as this young man did. I have to pay attention. But I'm not in the church because of grandma. She might be the person that brought me there. I have to be in the Lord's church because of Jesus Christ who suffered, bled, and died an ignominious death on the cross for me. If we don't have a relationship, I'm sitting in the pews and I'm waiting to become a victim. So generationally, how does it apply? This fellow, he had his eye on his face. He looked and he saw, yes, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that, but not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 7 and 21.
but he that does what? The will of my Father which art in heaven. Lady told me the other day, I raised $20,000 from this hospital bed. I did this. Preacher, you can't tell me. I was just trying to appeal to having a real relationship with the Lord. She wanted to show me all the stuff that she did. That doesn't help us. What helps us is to walk in a state of unity with God and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's there. Have you ever stopped to believe, to ask yourself, is God really real? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people get in church and they start telling God what to do. That's why I ask the question. Well, you know, folks don't want God in their business. <laughs> well, I don't think nothing's wrong with that. I don't think nothing. Wrong with that. I was right, you don't think. <laughs> You know, and I'm not one of those persons that everything you look at is a sin. I'm just saying, before I do anything, I try to check with the Lord. Because I know if I'm doing something wrong, he's going to bust me anyway, looking right at me. Amen. Yeah, right. It's going to sound crazy. <laughs> if you sin, realize you're doing it with God looking right at you. That's right. You see, that was hard for me. You know, because sometimes we as preachers, we try to scare folk because that's the only method we can use. But stop and be sober and think, God is sitting in on this conversation right now. Yes, he is. He is concerned about it. You know what's even scarier? He knows who's listening. Mm -hmm. You know what's even scarier? He knows who's going to take it and do something with it. You know what's even scarier? He knows. He knows everything that you are going to do wrong before you do it. And guess what? He loves you anyway. Mm -hmm. That ought to be enough incentive right there. But back to this young man. Man, I've done all that stuff from my youth. Tell me something different. You see? And so Jesus says to him, listen, you take that stuff that you have mm -hmm. and you go on That's a hard thing, and we can we can relate to it right now because we most of us got people down south right now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of folks in Georgia and Florida, and man, I'm concerned. My baby sister is down there with all my brother's kids and stuff, and I'm hollering, "Get out! We can put y'all in the garage." <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, but it's too late to get out. Mm -hmm. That a preach moment. Mm -hmm. It's too late to get out. When people are trying to get out, you can't get anywhere because other folks are in the way. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Some folks left Miami and ran to another city thinking that they were gonna run to another city and be safe. Well, guess what? That thing is chasing them. It's on its way to that other city now. And they got hotels filled with people running. When God allows, God didn't send the tornado. But when God allows, nothing can happen, first of all, without the Lord knowing it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Nothing can happen without the Lord allowing it to happen. So when it started to happen, he did not stop it. Look at what a judgment in the 21st century looks like. Amen. Guy comes to Jesus. He says, I want to know what, what, will I, what do I need for eternal life. Jesus says, you need to understand that you need to get rid of the things, your possessions. The reason why I brought the folks up down there is because I hear so many people talking about I got to save my house. I got to save this. I know, man, you got to save your life. <laughs> and that stuff, leave that stuff alone. Well, the, this young man had a problem with his stuff. And he, he went away sorrowful. Now, having set that standard, let me hasten on and show you something about brokenness. Number one, 
We talk generationally, right? But then what do we do personally? Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Just look back. In Matthew 15, I want to hit it at verse 3. Verse 3, Jesus is talking and he said, he said, but he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? For God commanded, saying, honor your father, your mother, and he that curseth the father or mother, let him die to death. But you say, but, but you say, you see that, whatsoever you shall say, is a father and mother. It is a gift. It is a gift. The word uh, in the Hebrew is a word called korban. Korban is a, a major strategy, basically, of the Pharisees, where they would take the possessions that they own and say that everything I own belongs to God. Now, if everything I own belongs to God, how can I take care of my father? And how can I take care of my mother? So when mom and dad kick off, I still have my possessions. Say it again. Corban says, everything I own belongs to God. Does everything you own belong to God? Y'all look at me strange now. Nobody say anybody. Y'all feeling stiff. <laughs> Everything I own in my life belongs to God. Mm -hmm. I was smart enough a few years ago to realize wherever I arrived, he brought me there. Now, God's car is outside, parked outside. At one time, I wanted a car to, to be hot stuff. You know, one to just the same colors as the car, or at least the interior. I wanted to do all that. Man, I don't go anywhere but church functions or to the grocery store or somewhere like that in God's car. And I had to look up and see that. I belong to God and everything I have belongs to Him. But you know the great part about that? When something ain't right, He has to fix it. Well. Amen, gospel friend. He has to fix it. He's in charge. Everything you have, no matter whether it's a hair pin, a bobbin pin, a fork in the kitchen, you know, if it's gold and you saving it for company, that's God's fork, man. It belongs to him, and everything goes for his purpose. These men said, everything I own belongs to God, but it was a lie. And so here's what Jesus does about it. Look up in uh, verse 7. He said, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah the prophet prophesy to you by saying, this people draw not unto me with their mouths. They honor me with their lips. But what? Their hearts are what? Far from me. Far from me. Listen to this. In vain. They do what? Worship. worship. But what kind of worship is it? It's in vain. In vain they do worship. This young man was worshiping God in vain. Because the things that he had, they were supposed to be attributed to God, but that was a lie. And the lie was exposed when, 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 when Jesus said, well, get rid of it. Do what we do. Come be a preacher. Come be a disciple. Give it to people. Come on, man. Talk back. Speechless. Speechless. On a personal level, you can see that it was, when it came down to material things, it was broken. Which begs the question, 
how much did he share out of his riches anyway? Because Jesus profiles another man, and that man died. You got a man uh, taking the crumbs from his table, and, but never mentioned him giving uh, Lazarus a loaf of bread or anything. What is it about certain people, if they're wealthy, that they want to top top with more wealthy people and don't want to give folks anything that needed? This is a problem and even in this country. The rich man, he said, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I can't, man. I'm not going to go home. I got people that, that bring me my food. Uh, I got people. Fix my bath. I got people who wash my horse, mule, donkey, whatever it is. I can't do that. Jesus. I can't go like that. I can't. I can't sleep outside. I can't. I can't. I can't. This is what's wrong with the church today. We can't. <laughs> you see, we set conditions on what we'll do. We tell God what we're gonna do. In other words. I don't want God messing around in my life. Hmm. All right, come on now, just, this is who I am. I don't want him in my business. I want him to stay 1885 East 89th Street. Amen. And, and so this is a personal problem. When my life, listen to me, when my life and my worship and my affiliation with Christian, when that is separate, that's brokenness. Mm -hmm. That's brokenness. We all know that when we have certain functions in the church, there are some members we never see. Amen. Mm -hmm. We never see. Them. I don't know what the reasons are. They might have real reasons, you see. But I'm looking at it. These folk here, I've been looking at these folk all my life in the church, amen? It's important to grasp it and to see, what do I do about a thing like that? Now, I've got a few minutes left, right? I think so. And I want to, I want to get real close now if I can, all right? Turn the page, because we're talking about private we went to first when we talked about pride. Whatever we do, whatever we do, write this down. This is where we go. Ready? Don't wait. Don't wait for crisis to make a decision for you. Don't wait for a crisis to make a decision for you. As you go to the doctor, well, I felt fine. No, no wait for crisis to make a decision for you. Well, did you get counseling from the preacher? You wanted to get married, and now the boy gone somewhere else with somebody else. Well, you should have went and got somebody to talk to before you say, I do. You just don't go jumping. You don't know nothing about him. I thought I love him. I love him. But no, no, you don't know him. Now you mad at me and you ain't going to talk to me no more. But you'll go off with him and then a year later, you know, spend up all the money and you're going to move everything and you find out he's in some rehab place. Don't wait for crisis. Okay? And tell folks the way you're going. Don't, don't just go. Where you been? I don't I, I, where, where have you been? I love you. There are people out there knocking people in the head. Can't you tell somebody where you've been? Don't wait for crisis. You see? Y'all listen? Mm -hmm. Don't wait for crisis because it'll make a decision for you. It'll make a decision for you. So we have to go interiorly now. All right. We talked about Adam, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about he set things in order, right? And then we talked about personal brokenness. So we're going to step back for just a second. Write this down. There is a process that we study. It's called nature and nurture. Nature and nurture. 
very important for the life of the Christian because you have to look around and you have to see that all of us weren't born with a silver spoon in our lives. And we came from different backgrounds, didn't we? When, when I grew up in this city, I, I came from down there in the last part. You couldn't go any further than the projects down, down there on 40 or 30 feet of school. The bucket of blood, they call it. That's where I grew up at. I grew up, um, uh, folks used to say I was a tough guy in the neighborhood. I'm here to testify. Whatever happened, it was always leave me alone. That's how bad it was. Mama and Daddy was just starting out. So that's where we live. Nurture is your environment. Nature is Mama and Daddy. What goes on inside the house has a lot to do with personal brokenness. Man, oh man. I'm not ratting out my family. But you know, I hardly ever saw daddy, uh, you know, without a big tall slits. One of them big tall ones, you know. Uh, daddy smoked. You know, he never cursed. I never heard my father curse. My father never whipped me, but my mother sure did. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, uh, the environment. Then they got a divorce. And they got the divorce on me. I was the child when they got the divorce. You can sometimes psychologically think you're responsible because I was with them a lot when they were arguing. And because in those days they weren't paying attention, I could hear it. And it had to be traumatic because I remember it. If you ask my son about Disney World, where I took him, he does not remember that. But there are other things, like us being in a fire somewhere when he was young, he remembers it. Your parents set out a standard, sometimes that they don't intend to set. And personally, you pick it up. Remember the story about the uh, we've heard it in the church for years, the woman cooking, woman cooking out this pot. <laughs> you remember that one? And uh, her husband finally said, man, why, why do you keep using this old pot? She said, well, my mother, my mother used this kind of pot. He said, well, ask mom, why do you use, it? well, grandma did. And they asked grandma, why do you, grandma said it was the only one I had. <laughs> Sometimes the tradition, the generational tradition, runs into the personal thing in your life. And mama and daddy, you know, I never saw my mother and father fight, but when I went visiting to my relative, boy, they was at war. That affects you on a personal level. Now, how does, why is he saying that? Because now, one of us has talked to you and you've become a member of the family of God. Oh, I've been saved. Jesus has saved me. Yes, but guess what? That stuff is called baggage. It's in there. So if mama or daddy would always shout at you real quick like that, and somebody in here loses themselves in here and shout, oh, don't you shout at me. Next thing you know, we got problems in the church. Amen. We got problems. Well, brother, be holy. Oh, give me that holy stuff. <laughs> because personally, that seed had been dropped into your life, and now it's a part of your system, and then in order to confront it, that's what we're talking about, you've got to understand what the purpose of God giving you his Holy Spirit for. He's the teacher. He's teaching you. Look, you've got these issues that your that the, your nature, your mom and dad. You got to, Jesus wants to give you a new life. He wants to uh, dig down and get the roots of that thing. 
Otherwise, you'll still be in the church with hand-me-downs. Y'all got it? Hand-me-downs. Are you looking at me saying, why do you keep looking at me? I'm just looking at everybody. Okay. Um, but nature, four, four areas, nature. Now, of course, because your family, uh, the home is a person. I'm sorry, nurture. The home is one place for nurturing, right? Mm -hmm. So if we all eat beans, we all eat beans. We nurture a certain way. In the house, we have certain values. We were nurtured in the house. We have personal values. Say amen if you understand now. Go in there and brush your teeth. Go in there and comb your hair. Go in there and put your clothes on. Pick your stuff up. Put the room back like it's supposed to. Then there's self-esteem. Self-esteem. They gave you self-esteem. We used to have, um, we used to have, uh, we'd make the kitchen backstage and uh, make the, the, the living room uh, that was there in the kitchen back there. Everybody had it. And we'd take the lamp and we'd turn the lamp down as a spotlight and we'd all do some type of act. You see? Nurturing. Nurturing. Building cohesion in the family. So you learn values, you learn to communicate, you learn to build self-esteem. And if you've got one of the fighting families, you, instead of, oh yeah, a couple of blocks from here, they still live there. Uh, family of 19 of them in the family somehow. I can't name no names, I'll get in trouble. But uh, 20, 22 of them, that many kids. Uh, a couple of blocks from here. And some of them still live there. Um, they were fighting families. You did not start a fight with them. It was so many of them coming. You understand? Once you get nurtured in your home, you come out and the second place of nurturing is your neighborhood. Whatever's on the walls, y'all got it? You've seen it written on the walls? Huh? Seen it in the hallways? Hey, you learn how to say certain words because you read them. <laughs> you see? You were nurtured in the environment that you were in. Well, you go to school. Number three. An environment to be nurtured in, right? But, and I've taught in East Technical High School, I've taught in Glenville High School, I've taught in Collinwood High School, I know what I'm talking about. I went to Glenville. There is a classroom in the classroom. There's a classroom in the hallway. There's a classroom in the bathroom. There's a classroom in the hidden behind the stairs. There's a classroom on the playground. If you get caught wrong in any of those classrooms where there's no teacher, you're going to be nurtured all right. <laughs> and you're going to learn either to defend yourself or to become a victim. Well, I come into the church and I learn, you see. And if God, the Holy Spirit, is not able to get you to surrender, you'll be our fighting person in the church. That make sense? Yes, you will. And you got to say, well, Lord, uh, I surrender. How does this relate to the rich young group? Look, fighting wasn't his problem. It was possessions. But guess what? We all got some type of brokenness in us. Some of us got a lot of brokenness in us. You married, you discover brokenness in the marriage. And man, sometimes brokenness in the marriage can call brokenness to the marriage. Say amen if you understand. So what is the last, and I guess that's it for me, right? What is the last nurturing environment? 
I hate to say this. It's the church. But sometimes the church is not the most positive and nurturing environment as she should be. All right. Let me take my wig off. <laughs> There's so much hell going on in churches. Well. So much foolishness. I mean, you know, I've been to some churches. I've been all over this country, either singing and preaching. And I'm telling you, if, if I didn't see it, it's because I didn't stay long. You say, I hear people come back and tell me, I went to such and such church. They got it together. No, you just didn't see it. Mm. Mm. What problem that we have that the rich man had? is that we think more of ourselves than we ought to think. Write this down. Amen. I am not overconfident. I am not underconfident. I am confident in Christ. Amen. I can do all things through Christ. Why? Because he strengthens me. He is my power. He is my everything. He is my all in all. He's the one. And the day that I get to thinking, oh man, I went down to this church, and man, I, man, I, boy, you got a problem. And any preacher in here, or any teacher knows when you get up to speak, you know that stuff that you say that you hadn't even planned to say, because God was speaking. But it has to be His way. It has to be His way. There would be times when I would get right there at the center point and, and go to speak. And uh, man, I would have all kinds of butterfly feelings. Until I realized it wasn't, wasn't my business, it was God's business. And, uh, and I'm closing now. And then that wonderful day, uh, Rick, you remember that day that I was up in the pulpit? Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I, I was a new Christian, and I want to preach like everybody else, and I was up there, and we would take a board, and it was the old wheelchairs then, and we'd take a board, slide it underneath me on the armrest, and I'd be sitting on the board, and so I'd be sitting up in the boat. And one of our loving brothers was so busy trying to get get the board under me, he just pushed me like that out the way. Well, when he pushed me, that pulpit came. I hit the pulpit, the pulpit crashed down on the communion table, and everybody went, oh! And my line after that was, I should extend the invitation right now, because it proved you can go at any time, <laughs> even here. Sometimes the church is a warm and loving and friendly and family environment like she's supposed to be. People should be able to come in here and take off their shoes if they want to and sit back and just listen to the word. And man, when this church gets to singing, woo, mm -hmm. bring tears to your eyes. I'll pull out some old uh, tape or something from back in the day and. Man, I gotta, get, I gotta go. I gotta get turn that thing off because when I come into this facility, there was so much love for me in this place that I can even smell the walls. I told him that. He said, "Okay." <laughs> Doubt it because home has a certain smell to it. But going to that, that we have to deal with is the fact that what do I do with the brothers and the sisters that are not behaving like Christians? Do I hate them? Do I retaliate? No, man, you're defenseless. You have to love them. Ah. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And if you let a person rent space in your head while giving you a dime, on the worry wheel, I'm like, I get on my nerves. Don't tell me something, something, something. And you doing all that stuff. You wasting God's time because God gave you that perpetual memory 
so that you can remember scriptures, prayers, and things like that. So, summing it all up. Private, private life. How is private life? How is personal life? How is uh, generational life and brokenness to God? It's this way. Each day that I live, I got to understand that worship is 24 hours a day. Are y'all listening? Worship is 24 hours a day. I don't come to the church building just to worship. I worship God 24 hours a day. You can't pray without ceasing. I don't believe it. Yes, you can. Because you live a life of prayer. You walk with God. And prayers don't have to take 15 minutes. That's only when certain people uh, get carried away. Amen. The best prayer is, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Right? Well, you can pray without ceasing. It's important to know that if you are going to avoid what the rich man fell victim to, the word is simple. It's called surrender. But don't let crisis make the decision for you. There's so many people that I see in hospital beds, in hospice, in some type of crisis, and now they're ready to do what God says. Don't wait for crisis to make the decision for you. Surrender to God. All to thee I now surrender, right? Isn't that the song we sing? I surrender all. Well, now you got to sing it and you really got to mean it. And on each day, you practice it like a lawyer practices law, like a doctor practices medicine, and you begin to grow. When someone treats you mean, treat them nice. And when you, when you get finished with a confrontation, walk away from it. If you feel like you want to think about it over and over again, start singing. Yeah. Start singing. And it will change and once you get into a habit of New Testament Christianity, the rich young man will be an example for you to talk to other people. This guy wanted to be something, but he didn't want to do it on God's terms. How many people want to be Christian, but they don't want to do it on God's terms? Well, if you want to know the rest, you're going to have to come back next time. Or if there's any questions, I'll open up right now and let you ask any questions. Any questions? Don't everybody shout at the same time now. Take, let somebody else answer. Okay, in that case, then let us pray. Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, because now we have opened our hearts to say, Lord, we surrender. We submit to your word. We sell that thing that is so personal to us that we want to possess it. Help us to see that without you, Lord, we can't do anything. We pray for a unified body. We pray for churches working together and working with their minister and uh, men and women. We pray, Lord, that wherever any, any uh, untruths or disquietness comes, we squash it because we are your church. We thank you for the things you've said to us. We ask you, Lord, that we continue to remember and talk about them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I lost track of my time. Hmm? This is session number 13.